Um, so with that, I would like to bring up our first um, expert speaker, Dr. Rick Harper, uh, Director of the Office of Economic Development and Engagement, sometimes also called OEDE, at the University of West Florida. We are pleased to have Dr. Harper share with us some of the key indicators in the economic and workforce development bucket of needs, as well as in the area of tourism for our community. Dr. Harper. <clears throat> Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm happy to be here today with uh, my colleague, Dr. Jane Caffrey, a biology professor uh, at UWF and a member of the Center for Environmental Diagnostics and Bioremediation. Uh, I, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, I've, I've been asked to speak briefly about economics, uh, workforce development, and tourism. Jennifer, we're, we're about 15 minutes behind. Yeah. Would you like, uh, what would you like for Jane and me to do about that? I think we should take 10 minutes. Okay. All right. So, um, I'd like to start uh, by uh, looking at uh, the health of the economy uh, and then move to a couple of slides on the change in the workforce that we're looking at, the role of education, and then uh, personal income received by Northwest uh, Floridians, and then where do we go from here? So I'll zip through these slides, which are, of course, going to be available to you. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, where we are today uh, in the U.S. You can see we're still recovering from the Great Recession, shaded in in gray. Even though we've, we're well on our way out of the recession, we still haven't gotten back to where trend says we ought to be. So we're still uh, earning less income, producing less output than we ought to be uh, at this uh, point in time. What has that done, uh, the fact that we're producing less? Here's real, real meaning inflation adjusted median household income. Uh, and what you can see is that it peaked in the late 1990s and that currently uh, we're about uh, five, $6,000 below in inflation adjusted terms where we were uh, um, 15 years ago, and so that's a challenge that we face. The distribution of income is changing as well. The share of national income going to wages and salaries has been falling over time, greater returns to uh, owners of capital, and this is uh, a challenge that we all feel as we go about our work in the community uh, with not-for-profits, with for-profit entities, that uh, there's increasing levels of pressure on wage earners to, to make a living, and uh, uh, there are underlying economic drivers for that, of course. So uh, I'd like to look now at the oil spill period. What we have here, Pensacola is uh, in the blue. This is total non-farm employment. This is change from the same month prior year. And uh, what you can see here is a pattern that's repeated, uh, particularly in northwest Florida metro areas that uh, we were first out of the spill that uh, in 2009 we had reached the uh, minimum in terms of uh, shrinkage in the economy and that by early 2010 we'd actually started to grow. Uh, the uh, uh, red is Florida. We were growing faster than the rest of Florida. We started out of the recession earlier, growing at the same rate, but exited the recession uh, and incurred positive growth relative to the same month uh, prior year. Uh, and then as the oil spill hit, the Northwest Florida economies undoubtedly uh, benefited from BP remediation spending, advertising to get tourists here, and also the Gulf Coast Claims Facility that was paying out uh, awards. Uh, however, as Gulf Coast Claims Facility transitioned and is now, of course, the court-supervised uh, settlement uh, program, the CSSP, uh, what we saw was that those payments slowed down and, in fact, growth in Northwest Florida, which had been outpacing the rest of the nation and the rest of the state, uh, slowed to, uh, to zero uh, so that we were no longer growing. However, now, as we hit 2013, 2014, the good news is that our percentage growth, this is employment, uh, we can see more pronounced patterns in other data series such as retail sales, for example. Um, we are now growing faster than the rest of the nation by a substantial margin in our two-county area, which is great news. We don't usually do that, uh, but uh, there are some, uh, some very uh, positive employment uh, uh, trends in the Pensacola economy, and we're, in fact, growing as fast as the rest of the state. Um, then if we uh, look at uh, Pensacola more specifically, this is a co index of coincident economic activity the Haas Center's developed. And uh, you can see there at the very right-hand end, there's our leading index. And what it shows is that uh, the future looks bright for Pensacola. But what's happened to the, the structure of the economy and the economy that we will all be working with over the next decade as we implement these restore-based programs? Um, 
what we can see is that relative to 1990, if we look at a full year of data for a recent year, 2013, we can see that the share of the economy of education and healthcare back in 1990 was 11%. It's grown today to 17%. Uh, we can see that government, traditionally our uh, big job creator with the Naval Air Station, uh, has shrunk from 24% down to 17. The other big shrinkage has occurred in manufacturing, going from 9% of jobs in the economy to four. It's not that we produce less stuff, it's that it takes less people to produce it because factories become more productive. We're still producing more than ever at international paper, ascend performance materials, et cetera, but we're doing it with fewer people. The other things that have grown, importantly for this discussion, leisure and hospitality employment has grown substantially over the last two decades, as has other business services. Uh, and so the real story, in a nutshell, Government and manufacturing traditional strengths have fallen in terms of their share of jobs, education, healthcare, uh, business services, leisure, hospitality have grown. Well, what does that look like over the past couple of years? If we look at Pensacola, we can see that of the 4,600 jobs, 2.9% over the three years uh, up until uh, late 2014, leisure and hospitality clearly leads the way. And to get that 4,600 jobs, that counts some loss in other services. Uh, construction is where we count, uh, construction is counted in natural resources, and actually in something that is a little bit scary for our local economy, we are no longer seeing education and healthcare growing in employment. Undoubtedly, this is in anticipation of the cost cutting envisioned under the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, but what we see is that leisure and hospitality is really leading the way in terms of job growth. Well. Turning to the role of education, here's a chart. This is all the 3,000 plus counties in the United States. I'm looking at uh, education, the percent of the resident population with a bachelor's degree or higher, uh, crossed with uh, annual per capita personal income by county of residence. And what we see is that the high education counties, Arlington, Virginia, Alexandria, Virginia, Los Alamos, uh, New York, they tend to have uh, very high levels of income as well, measured on that axis. And then, of course, Williams, North Dakota, Sully, South Dakota. We see less education, but more employment due to fracking, and that's high wage employment. And then if you look at Florida, it's interesting that actually, for those of you who remember your, your college statistics, um, if you look at the relationship between education and personal income, that simple uh, bivariate relationship explains 60, so two thirds of the variance in uh, income in the United States. It's a very important relationship. Uh, Escambia, Santa Rosa are right in here. If you look at the poor counties in the states, I mean, and it's not true what you often hear about Escambia being the poorest county in the state, it's fair to say that it's among the poorest large counties in the state. But the poor counties are places like Calhoun, Jackson, Washington, Liberty, Hendry, Glades, all of the rural farming counties in Florida, the small counties, they're the ones with extremely low levels of uh, economic attainment, and that's correlated highly with a low level of income. Uh, here is a, a chart showing work that uh, Dr. Rod Lewis did some excellent work when he was at the Haas Center working with Jennifer McFerrin, Jennifer Grove, uh, the folks at the chamber to look specifically at information technology and advanced manufacturing. I won't go into this chart. You have those, uh, that in your packet and can look at those uh, occupations in detail. Um, now, turning to personal income, back in 1970, the United States got up and went to work every day, 77% of people. 77% uh, of personal income came from getting up and going to work, 14% came from dividends, interest, and rents, which is income from wealth, and 9% came from transfer payments, payments from the federal government. By 2010, that had changed dramatically. Uh, only two-thirds of our income came from getting up and going to work in the morning, 16%, a little bit more than in 1970, came from wealth. But the huge change, more than doubling in percentage, was transfer payments. These are payments from the U.S. government that are not payments for current activity, but they are transfers based on your past work activity, such as uh, Social Security, or your need for health care, such as Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, and here it is for Pensacola. Even more so than the U.S., we were a community that got up and went to work in the morning. 83% of our personal income in 1970 came from uh, labor income, but by 2010, that was down to 61%. And 
income from transfer payments had risen from 7% to 23. Well, where do transfer payments go? Here's total personal income. What we see is that Fort Walton Beach in the Fort Walton Beach MSA now includes Walton County as a result of the 2010 census. We have a new two county metro area which is called the Crestview Fort Walton Destin MSA. It is Okaloosa and uh, Walton counties. Income there almost hits the national average, which for Florida is pretty doggone respectable. We face challenges in Pensacola. We're doing better than Mobile. Uh, we started to grow in the year 2000. That's largely the George W. Bush inspired pay increases for military in our community uh, going on there. But uh, the good news is we are growing. The challenge is that military employment is no longer growing and that education and healthcare are uh, slowing down. So then um, let's look at median age of uh, the resident population. Uh, that I'm sad to inform you that we're all getting older. Uh, and, and this graph shows it. Actually, here's Florida. Florida is getting older. The US is getting older. Uh, at about the same rate as Florida, the slope of those two lines are the same, but what's happening here in our local metro areas is that we unfortunately are aging faster than the rest of the nation or the state. Of course, these are median ages, so it includes the whole population, but we're getting more retirees. And then that means that we get more transfer payments because transfer payments in the United States are not transfers to poor people, they are transfers to old people. Okay. The, the U.S. federal government is basically a social welfare program for old people that fights wars on the side. And, and that's what the federal government does. Okay. And so Florida has always been old, so it's not getting any more transfer payments than before. But Northwest Florida is only now getting older, and so we are getting more and more transfer payments, which explains why it's growing so much. Dividends, interest, and rents, that's income from wealth, Fort Walton Beach, particularly the 30A corridor in Destin, very wealthy. But Pensacola, again, is doing better than Mobile. Here's what population growth looks like going forward. You can see it's declining overall over the decades. Um, but if you look at the fastest growing segment, for Pensacola, it is the 65 and over. The rest of our population is going to be relatively stagnant from 2010 to 2040, but seniors are growing rapidly, both as a share of population and in numbers. That has profound implications for the services that we deliver, and it has profound implications for the kind of jobs that we'll be doing in the community as we serve that population. So at that point, let me turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Jane Caffrey. Thank you, Rick. Great. Well, I'm going to talk about um, environmental indicators. Hopefully get some slides up. And um, just to introduce myself, um, I'm a professor at the University of West Florida, the Center for Environmental Diagnostics and Bioremediation. It's kind of a mouthful. But my, uh, my main interest is uh, what happens in the waters in Pensacola Bay and surrounding coastal areas. And it's been a, a place where I've been uh, doing research um, over the last uh, <clears throat> 10, 15 years. So just to, uh, just to start out, uh, with, with a little bit of context, we've already, we've already looked at this in terms of what the, uh, what the goals are from the, from the Restore Act plan um, in terms of uh, trying to make the environment right um, following the BP oil spill, the, the tragedy that, uh, that we faced uh, for both the environment and the, and the local economy. <clears throat> Uh, again, this is uh, just drawing on the same information that you have in your, in your packet. And so my interest is, uh, you know, what happens in the environmental side of things? What, what sort of uh, information would be useful as you try to develop environmental projects? What sort of information um, is, uh, could be relevant in terms of trying to um, pull some of these things together? So just to, um, just to start out by looking at uh, what the definition of environmental uh, indicators are, um, one of the main uh, definitions that the EPA uses is the effects of human activities on the environment. And as we'll look um, over the next uh, couple of minutes, uh, clearly uh, humans have had a large impact in the Pensacola Bay system. And 
These environmental indicators are based on uh, scientifically based information, so collected uh, information that looks at both what the condition is in the environment and how it has changed over time. So what kinds of environmental indicators are there? There are a large number of them. There's no way that I can really go over all of them. Um, my particular interest is, uh, is water quality and um, looking at particular uh, things that lead to uh, having a healthy environment uh, is dependent on having good water quality. Um, there's also indicators associated with uh, contamination in the environment, and I'll uh, briefly uh, cover uh, some related to that. Uh, air quality is also very critical, and um, we have to breathe the air, and uh, you know when it's very often you can, you can tell when you're not breathing good air. Um, and uh, there are different air quality indicators. Um, I'm not really going to go over those, but there, but there are a variety of, of indicators that um, information is available. Um, one of the big efforts in Restore is our natural resources, our biological communities, and so I'll briefly talk about that. Um, and there are different ways of looking at it. There are particular keystone species, uh, species that are, are essential for um, for environments to be healthful, healthy. Uh, if you have a marsh, you, you need the marsh grasses there. You're not, you're not going to have a marsh if you don't have the, the specific species that make that marsh healthy. Uh, biodiversity can be very important. The fact that you have a wide diversity of, of animals um, and plants within the environment uh, can be critical for it being healthy. Um, probably most of you are familiar with endangered species, and, and those are often the bellwethers when we have problems with endangered species. Um, that's often an indication that the environment is, is not as it should be. And so that's, um, that's another aspect that, uh, that may be useful in terms of uh, trying to de decide which sort, of, which sort of projects you bring forward. And then uh, finally, uh, human health indices. I'm not really going to cover that, but clearly that, that's another very important thing. Uh, there are relationships between uh, environmental indicators and, and human health. And so for those of you who are interested in, in community health, um, there, there are a few resources that, that I have included that might be helpful um, for you guys as you put uh, proposals together. So primarily talking about, uh, talking about water quality, um, I'm not really going to go through this in great detail to try to make up a little bit of time. Uh, my presentation uh, will be made available for anybody who's interested in it. And so I would encourage you, if you have questions or, or uh, comments, you know, that um, you can get in touch with me or, or you can get in touch with Robin um, to get in touch with me uh, about uh, some of these details. So clearly when we think about the water, there are some prime things that determine what organisms are going to be there. Uh, salinity and temperature, how much salt is in the water, uh, you know, what the water temperatures are. Um, oxygen is, is really important. Uh, almost all the animals that live uh, in the waters require oxygen to breathe. If you don't have oxygen, uh, you're, you're going to have a real reduction in your biological communities. Um, the state has uh, different requirements in terms of what those oxygen levels are. So if you're thinking about projects that might you know, influence uh, distribution of species, um, knowing what current oxygen levels are in the environment uh, might be helpful for making your case. Um, another important parameter is, is chlorophyll A. We have algae that live in the water. They're the base of the food web. A lot of other organisms feed on them. It's essential for, for our healthy ecosystems. They feed oysters. They feed a variety of, of different organisms. Um, so what the level of this is important, you can have too much of a good thing. If you have too much uh, chlorophyll in the water, you have excess amounts. You can actually lead to problems such as um, increased growth of bacteria that can lead to low oxygen, and you can have a feedback between chlorophyll and, and oxygen, and also a feedback between uh, nutrients that come in. And this, is, this has been a problem uh, historically. Many of you who have been here may remember from the 1960s and 1970s when there were large inputs coming into uh, Upper Escambia Bay and, and fish kills. There were a lot of nutrients coming into the system. So we need nutrients for plant growth. It's essential for, for plants to grow, but you can have too much of a good thing that can lead to uh, algal blooms and which can then lead to low oxygen levels. Other uh, water quality parameters that are often very important are, uh, are light um, and uh, turbidity. We have generally very clear waters here. 
those of you who like to go fishing and go out in the seagrass beds um, know that generally the waters are pretty clear there, and that's essential uh, for those seagrass communities to have high light levels. So if you are looking at projects to try to reduce turbidity, to try to reduce uh, nutrients um, coming into those seagrass beds, that would definitely benefit, um, benefit the environment in this region. And finally, uh, bacterial contamination can, uh, can represent a, a, a problem in water quality, and clearly we don't, we don't want to go swimming in an area that, that is like a sewer. So there is, um, there is uh, information available to look at what, what levels of uh, many of these parameters are. <clears throat> so uh, just to, uh, uh, may, maybe I'll just kind of go through this quickly. When you think about dissolved oxygen, uh, we do have, um, and I'll go back. We do have changes in oxygen uh, during the day. We have photosynthesis by plants that produces oxygen. We have oxygen levels get high. At nighttime, we have uh, respiration going on. Uh, things are breathing and there's no oxygen production. So we have this regular cycle. What can cause problems is when it gets below those threshold levels that the state has established and levels that can be uh, damaging for uh, invertebrates and for fish. Um, if we look at uh, what uh, kind of seasonal patterns we see in oxygen, uh, this is data from, uh, from mid Escambia Bay, and we see that over the season, generally in the summertime, we have very low uh, dissolved oxygen concentrations, uh, generally below this threshold of 2 milligrams per liter, which is the level at which we often see very negative impacts, often death, for many organisms. Um, and so, not all the time, but, but very often we will see uh, hypoxia in, in uh, mid Escambia Bay. Uh, this is a, a plot showing river flow. Um, uh, down the Escambia River, we get most of our uh, fresh water coming in uh, during, the, uh, during the spring. Another issue that has uh, been a longstanding concern in the region is industrial contamination because of uh, many uh, chemical plants that we have in the area. We have a, a lot of legacy uh, contaminants in the Bay. One of the most serious is PCBs. Um, in 1969, there was a PCB spill in the lower Escambia River. And um, this data was collected in uh, 2007 and 2008. And these red and yellow dots show uh, that we still have high levels of PCB in the sediments of Pensacola Bay. And this is a legacy of that, of that original spill. And, um, and so uh, that is still causing problems, uh, not only in the sediments, but this might be a little bit hard to see, but it's also in uh, fish communities. And so if you like to go, uh, like to go fishing, I would not recommend uh, uh, fishing for uh, for species that you want to eat in the uh, lower Escambia River and upper Escambia Bay because we continue to have, um, have high PCB uh, concentrations. And I will note that um, both of these uh, data that I'm, uh, slides that I've shown you are based on data that was collected as part of the uh, UWF um, uh, Escambia County study that was funded by the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, the CDC. Um, Perhaps some of you remember the Partnership for Environmental Research and Community Health that was conducted several years ago. And so um, this, this data represents right now our most up-to-date information about, uh, about contaminants in this, in this region as well as uh, they did a variety of studies looking at um, air uh, quality and, um, and other uh, human health related issues as well as other environmental issues. So, um, so we have this legacy of contaminants. We have uh, critical uh, environmental uh, communities, habitats that, uh, that we um, have seen declines in and that are candidates for uh, restoration. Um, I don't have an image of the salt marshes of the bay um, on this slide, but I do have, uh, this is the uh, um, indication of oyster reefs, and, and uh, this is from the uh, State uh, Department of uh, Agriculture and Consumer Services um, website looking where there is presently oyster harvesting uh, that is occurring. There are plans for doing, uh, I think many people are interested in doing uh, oyster restoration. And, um, and I would encourage you to, um, to try to look for uh, resources, um, you know, uh, information about where oysters have historically occurred 
because those might be you know, an indication of where you could do uh, restoration in the future. Uh, for seagrass restoration, uh, this is uh, the, one of the most uh, recent maps, which is now is pretty dated. It's from 2003. And so we generally have uh, seagrass beds remaining in Santa Rosa Sound and, uh, and Big Lagoon. And historic uh, seagrass beds in other parts of Pensacola Bay have been, have been significant, have seen si significant declines. And so I think, um, you know, as you, as you do, your, uh, <clears throat> do your planning, oh, this is, uh, if you're interested in seagrasses, um, this is a very good report uh, that was done looking at, um, looking at seagrasses throughout Florida. And this is uh, some of the uh, uh, things that they came up with as to why uh, Pensacola Bay is, um, is under stress. And um, <clears throat> they see uh, declines. Um, uh, water clarity is an issue um, right now. Uh, it seems like uh, nutrients and phytoplankton are, are not a particular issue. Um, uh, seasonal hypoxia and, and uh, hydrogen sulfide are, are an issue. Um, and so that would, be, that would be something, you know, if you wanted to look at restoration within those areas, you might, you might want to take a look at, at that report. So um, in your packets, you have this um, list of uh, environmental resources. If you're interested in getting basic water quality data, I highly recommend this first one. This is a uh, site that's set up by the uh, USGS and the EPA. It includes all of the USGS data, all the EPA data that's in Storet. If you've ever tried to work with Storet, it can be a challenge. This is a much easier portal to use. It's very, it's very intuitive. I, I use it all the time. Uh, EPA also has good information uh, it's called uh, Surf Your Watershed. It has not, not only uh, water quality information, it has air quality information, other sorts of community health information. Um, it has a variety of different resources in there. You can search uh, using your zip code or, or a variety of other ways. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the work that we've done in CEDB. Uh, the, the information about uh, fishes is, is uh, here within this link, the Fish Atlas um, link. And then all of the reports that were generated as a result of the PERCH pro project are, on, are online. So if you just go to the University of West Florida website and, and go to the uh, CEDB um, link within the university, you can, you can get much of uh, this information uh, really quite easily. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, other information that you might want to uh, 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 track. Uh, there is a lot of projects uh, being developed um, uh, as a result of uh, funding from BP through the Deepwater, uh, and this is present in the Deepwater Horizon uh, project tracker. Um, the Gulf of Mexico uh, Research Institute has um, uh, funded a lot of research, and so if you're interested in particular uh, oil-related uh, research, uh, both of these uh, links would give you information uh, relative to the most recent research that has gone on, stuff that might um, be a little bit hard to find otherwise. Uh, EPA also has a publication website. So if you're interested in, in looking for particular EPA publications, um, that, that's a good resource. Uh, this one is not in your, your packet, but there are, there are a lot of other uh, local information uh, from uh, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Environmental Health, the Northwest Florida Water Management District, um, the Nature, Conser Co Nature Conservancy has recently started uh, doing uh, watershed uh, proposals and, and projects, and so they have pulled together a lot of information. Um, in terms of uh, summary information, this came out in 2005. This was an EPA report, um, and so this probably is a very nice summary if you're just trying to get into some of the information that's already been summarized. This, I think, would be quite, quite helpful. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.